I'm Kara Case, Chief Executive of the Tao Trust, and I'm delighted to welcome you to our webinar on entrepreneurship, innovation, coronavirus, and Brexit, what the future holds. We are thrilled to have such wonderful panelists and guests today. They will all be introduced shortly. Before we begin, I want to share with you Tel Aviv University's extraordinary work since the early days of the pandemic, where some 120 researchers have been working 24 seven to turn their focus to combating COVID-19. While I do not have time to share the important research being carried out to find treatments, cures, or vaccines, detailed information on some of the groundbreaking work happening in Tao's labs is available on our website or via our individual friends' offices. Tao's experts have dropped everything to find solutions to the world's most pressing problem. To fund their work, Tao has created the Drop Everything Urgent COVID-19 Drive, a month-long campaign now in its final week. Your support is needed now more than ever. So please, if you can, support us. Our combined efforts will make a difference, and we thank you. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce Sharon Barley, the Chargé d'Affaires at the Israeli Embassy in the UK and an alumna of Tao. Her career spans more than two decades, having held postings in Uzbekistan, Australia, Turkey, and most recently Ghana, where she reopened Israel's embassy after 38 years. For her work as Israel's ambassador to Ghana and Liberia, she received the Ministry of Foreign Affairs Distinction Award. She has been a wonderful friend to Tao and the Trust, often speaking at our events, and I'm personally honored and delighted that she is with us tonight. I know how busy she is. Sharon, thank you, and please, the space is now yours. Thank you, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much, uh, uh, Cara, for your kind words. Um, I want to start by conveying uh, former ambassadors Regev uh, best wishes and uh, uh, apologies for not being able to be here today as he was recalled back to Israel upon the termination of his tenure in the UK and uh, I know how much he would have liked to be here. I spent the last three and a half years uh, working together with Mark as my ambassador but the truth of the matter is that Mark and I uh, uh, have known each other for the last 30 years and you can only uh, uh, guess where uh, we know each other from. We actually know each other from Tel Aviv University. Mark used to be my tutor at uh, uh, the political uh, sciences uh, uh, department uh, when I was uh, um, taking part in the academic reserve program of the uh, Israeli IDF and uh, we spent many hours discussing uh, Francis Fukuyama's hands of, end of history uh, and so on. But I have to say that I, I really I didn't have to be, I didn't have to, to wait to be posted uh, to London in order to reconnect with my uh, alma mater. Actually, even when I was an ambassador uh, uh, to Ghana, our embassy worked very hard in putting together uh, collaborations between Tel Aviv University uh, School of Public Health, headed by Professor Yossi Cohen, and Ghana University Noguchi, a medical research uh, uh, institute. And following this collaboration, later on, I met with uh, the then president of the university, Professor Klepter, and uh, we've discussed new and exciting ways to create collaborations between Tel Aviv University and the developing world. And uh, uh, I have to say that uh, uh, none of us really believed then that uh, such initiatives uh, will uh, enable Tel Aviv University to enjoy grants by a, a Johns Hopkins and other. So I think that part of the story there is actually to try and identify the opportunities, even in uh, uh, challenging uh, and difficult circumstances. Fast forwarding to our days today, I, uh, uh, we all know that the corona crisis created new realities um, for all of us. It doesn't matter what discipline you're coming from, it doesn't matter whether you sit in the United Kingdom or uh, uh, in Israel, we have to face uh, 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 challenges that uh, are not identical, they're very, very similar. 
And I think that it's valid also for universities and academic institutions, both in Israel and in the UK, academic institutions have to reinvent themselves from uh, so many different angles. They uh, need to align themselves with the changing reality. They need to create relevance. They need to put a lot of emphasis on applied research and um, also to attract students into uh, the university framework, which might not necessarily be able to offer the same student experience that uh, uh, youngsters are after when uh, they are enrolling uh, uh, to university. And while some will say that the crisis uh, uh, made countries uh, look inwards, uh, trying to decrease their dependency on, on supply chain, uh, chains and, and decrease their uh, international uh, dependency, I think that the crisis has also emphasized how important it is uh, uh, to collaborate and to work together, especially when uh, time is pressing and we're trying to achieve uh, solutions that uh, uh, might ease uh, uh, our ability to face a, a, a challenge in, in such magnitude. And I have to say that even for us as an embassy, the, the virus created new opportunities, new opportunities in advancing uh, academic and research collaborations between the two countries, opportunities in, the, in, in normalizing, if you like, the image of Israel in the UK uh, in general and in the campuses in particular, uh, no longer uh, the country that symbolizes only political challenges and dealing with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but a normal country like any other country, it has its political challenges, but at the same time, it has a lot to offer when it comes to research, when it comes to innovation, when it comes to, a, 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 to a, a advanced technologies a, a, and so forth. And uh, other opportunities are also in, in creating, um, I would say, proactive uh, interest uh, in the Israeli student, uh, which till now, uh, uh, British universities, we, we didn't see much of much effort on their behalf to attract the Israeli student. And, and now the, uh, 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 there is an opportunity there and we see the growing interest. And I, I would say in general that it enabled us to uh, emphasize the relevance that Israel has for the UK as a, a, a country that can be pivotal in uh, research and development in a post-Brexit world uh, uh, and how we can create this added value that makes us a, a, a priority country. Now, uh, these things don't happen by themselves and they don't happen in a void. Uh, I can tell you that we at the embassy, we are working tirelessly in order to uh, create these collaborations. Uh, it's been now three years in which we are uh, dispatching vice chancellors, university, uh, uh, vice chancellors delegations from the UK to Israel in order uh, to, to help them uh, and get acquainted, better acquainted with uh, uh, Israeli universities and, and, and what they have to offer. And I'm really delighted to share with you that we, uh, we can actually see the fruits of these delegations. And in the case of a, a Tel Aviv University, uh, I can point out at least four or five different collaborations that uh, uh, are taking place following uh, uh, the recent uh, uh, vi visit of the recent delegation uh, on, on life sciences together with the Oxford University, on uh, archaeology and human anthropo anthropology with the University of Liverpool, uh, with Sussex University, uh, Manchester University uh, on aging, and uh, uh, recently on COVID-19 uh, on cell biology with, together with Glasgow University uh, on viruses uh, uh, research. So when the British government is talking about uh, global Britain, about its post-Brexit uh, vision of, of global Britain, uh, uh, which will deepen the bilateral relations between countries, 
uh, uh, then I'm, I'm very proud to say that Israel's name is, is mentioned time and again as a, a, a priority country a, a, a among our, our British interlocutors. And if I need to sum it up, uh, and it will be really the, the last thing I'm going to say, on the backdrop of um, post-corona world, uh, in which we, I assume we can expect a, a growing dependency on technologies, um, maybe realignment of supply chains, uh, growing dependency or transition into, into leaning more and more on, on artificial intelligence, uh, emphasis on health technologies, medical technologies, and, and, and re this reinvention of entire sectors. When, when we look at all this in combination with the unique reality of the UK, now that we're coming towards the end of the transition period towards uh, exiting uh, the European Union, while London remains a major financial capital, uh, 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 global capital, major financial global capital. And uh, uh, while the policy, the stated policy of the British government is to strengthen and fasten bilateral uh, partnerships uh, under this Global Britain vision, uh, while emphasizing a, a priority countries, I really think that this combination puts us on a unique uh, uh, place uh, in time, unique place to be an entrepreneur, unique place to be an innovator, a unique place to create an added value in these collaborations between uh, uh, our countries. And therefore, I find today's webinar extremely timely. And uh, I'm really looking forward to, to, to listen to the discussion. And uh, thank you very much. Let's enjoy the webinar. Thanks. Um, Sharon, thank you so much. Thank you for taking the time to join us. We really appreciate your warm greetings. And we hope to see you in person. Uh, sometime soon here in London. So thank you and, and good luck. Um, we have a slight change in our webinar now because uh, Moshe Zvaran, who is supposed to join us, he's the Dean of the prestigious Color School of Management at Tau. Uh, there were some difficulties with him joining. So um, technology sometimes can fail. So instead, I'd just like to welcome and introduce Fiona Dorman, general partner at JVP and a Tau alumna, Liad Agmon, CEO of Dynamic Yield and the Tau alumnus, and Elena Kononova, a student at the SOFAR Glo Global MBA program at Tau. And I'm gonna pass the baton over to Fiona who will share more and ask questions. And thank you so much all of you for joining us today. So thank you very much. Um, good afternoon to our UK attendees, to my Israeli fellows and European guests, and I'm delighted uh, to be here today. Um, stepping in for Moshe, the um, esteemed uh, Dean of the College School of Management, who's here watching but having trouble with the audio. So we're delighted to be the discussion on entrepreneurship, innovation, coronavirus, and how could we miss it, Brexit, what the future holds. But as a first line of matter of business, I'd like to extend um, our deepest appreciation and thanks to Cara Case and her team at Tel Aviv University Trust in the UK, and to Ayana Segal Cohen from the TAU, Tel Aviv University, for organizing and orchestrating this event. So COVID-19 has made a devastating impact on the world economy. Um, in addition, the UK is still struggling with the impact of the Brexit decision. And in light of this, um, the idea of our webinar today is to discuss the impact of COVID and to a degree Brexit to the best we can on the world of innovation, entrepreneurship and new venture creation. Now, Tel Aviv University in general, and the College School of Management in particular, an integral part of the startup nation. Um, we carry the flag um, of entrepreneurship and innovation for many years. So when Kawa uh, reached out to all of us, the immediate reaction was, well, let's go for it. So let me just tell you a little bit about Tel Aviv University. So um, myself, my name is Fiona. Um, my full name is actually Refsen Darman, and I'm uh, born and bred in the UK. Um, been in Israel most of my life, and I'm the general partner of uh, probably one of the most successful venture capital funds in Israel. 
And uh, I'm also a graduate of Tel Aviv University, actually the Kellogg uh, Executive MBA program that I did uh, during my career. Um, and one of the things that we're extremely proud of in Israel as uh, graduates and alumni, alumni of um, Tel Aviv University is it really is by far probably the number one university in terms of entrepreneur graduates. I mean, we're an investor, we have 140 companies in our portfolio and a vast majority really do originate uh, the leadership out of Tel Aviv University. So Tau or Tel Aviv University as I call it, like in many other universities is a producer of technological managerial know-how. Um, it's two types of clusters. You've got the technology agents, um, you know, these are the, let's call it the innovators um, and, the, and the, the entrepreneurs. And you've also got the education side of things, which is all about nurturing, culture, cultivating innovation, entrepreneurship, the audacity, the go-getting and giving all the skills to really build something out of your dream and your passion. Uh, Tel Aviv University is one of the 10 universities um, in the world in global rankings for innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, you know, some of the biggest household names came out of Tel Aviv University. I mean, Waze is one that many of you know in my own portfolio, got Tel Aviv, um, Beth Array, and there's many others really coming out of great knowledge and the combination of that um, innovation with the audacity that is basically the side of the entrepreneurship. Um, and for Israeli entrepreneur universities under the Times of Israel's recent report, shine among the top 50 producers of entrepreneurs. Um, you know, Israel is really the entrepreneur nation when it comes to the number of people that have that passion and go-gettedness to go out of there. So uh, the idea of this, I'm not going to go into the whole session. I'll, I'll, I believe that the great team from Towers kept you updated. This is the building that I studied at, uh, which is the Collar School of Management. So what I thought we'd do here is maybe take a step back and um, I'm going to ask the first question that I plan to ask myself, which is really um, how innovation is related to the crisis. Now, just I'm going to say a few words. So we're a big venture capital fund. We manage about $1.4 billion. But when coronavirus hit, and, it, and especially came and hit Israel around early March, when all of us who'd been traveling the world in February found ourselves coming back to quarantine, I think it was the end of the first week of March. I don't know, Liad, if you were part of that group, but all of us were sitting there uh, for two weeks in our homes, not understanding that the world was basically turning on its head. Um, and I think what has been interesting in seeing Israel as a pseudo R&D center of the world, how it embraced um, the crisis. So on the one hand, you saw like in many players around the world, the first thing was all about cash. So um, before you even, start trying to understand when you come out of this bunker, how the world's affected the buying power, the interest, the appetite, the need, um, and so on. You first of all needed to make sure that you had cash. So many of the entrepreneurs and startups in Israel, it was all about, let's get the cash, make sure we're gonna weather this storm, and then let's go out there and see what's interesting. And what's really been amazing in Israel is the innovation. Um, you saw come front stage, everything to do with digital health and medical devices from, the, from telemedicine, from biomedicine, uh, tracking devices that were able to monitor you while you were in the ward and, um, and, um, and the such. And it really was all about um, the combination of data, um, innovation and healthcare that all came together. It was all about predicting. It was all about being able, able to measure your heat using plasma and other devices. But it really, everybody got at the busy. So on the one hand, it was a crazy situation where you had to protect your home and you were sitting doing a Zoom uh, you know, from your bedroom. But on the other hand, it was all about how am I going to tackle this crisis? What kind of innovation am I gonna to start to develop? And the craziest of all is you were doing it at home and it was the intersections. It was the intersections of the innovation when the innovator met the entrepreneur and they had something new and there was that pressing need out there. So, Elena, what do you think? Um, Elena's here with us, and I'd love to hear your opinions on what I've just said. Um, I agree with you 100%. Um, and to me, I guess innovation is something that is both creative and useful. And um, I think this is where 
it's a little bit different from intern entrepreneurship because entrepreneurship does not have to be creative in itself and an entrepreneur can be uh, can be innovative and cannot be and can be not innovative so this is the main difference for me that's how i see it fantastic Eliad. You know, what would you like to say from your crazy experience? I think before everybody joined, we were hearing about you being a McDonald's employee. So maybe talk about in innovation, entrepreneurship and yourself. And I uh, wait, wait, Lian, unmute. Yeah, I'll unmute. Um, so, so some background maybe. Uh, so um, I, I've, I've been running companies for a while now. Dynamic Yield, my third company. It was founded in 2012 and got acquired uh, by McDonald's uh, in April 2019 uh, for about $300 million, uh, in case I thought we published. Um, so we, we are a startup. We are still a standalone mm -hmm. company, but we are McDonald's a subsidiary. Um, mm -hmm. So coming into Corona, we basically, I don't believe in God, but I thank God 10 times a day for not being a startup any longer when COVID uh, hit everyone, you know, because uh, uh, as Fiona mentioned, uh, cash flow and funding are critical for startups. And uh, the fundraising environment in March and April was really a disaster. I think it's picking up right now. But uh, if you got, you know, if you're unlucky to be without money uh, in March, um, some of the startups went belly up. Um, so, um, so Fiona, if you have more specific questions, happy to answer. No, no, absolutely. Um, no, but Liad, I think in your case, I mean, you, you had that amazing acquisition by McDonald's and you yourself are a serial entrepreneur. I think it would be good to, to hear a little bit of your takeaways of how do you handle this type of environment? Like what stands out? You talk about the fundraising climate being a little bit weaker during COVID. You know, what are the insights that you have? What are the takeaways? What did you guide your team I know you're part of McDonald's now, but what are the takeaways you can give other people and, and you know, just help those people out there understand what's needed? Yeah, I think 2020 brought in two mm. things that no startup mm. entrepreneur thought that they would have to handle, right? Like the global mm. epidemic. Um, we have about 270 employees in Dynamic Yield. I put aside the 2 million in McDonald's. Uh, we care more about uh, <laughs> like our part of the business. Uh, but uh, 270 um, um, uh, Dynamic Yield employees uh, in four offices uh, in, in New York, London, Berlin, and Tel Aviv. Um, and we had a very office-centric culture. Out of the 270 employees, maybe 20 worked remote. Suddenly, overnight, we need to work in a, in a completely distributed fashion. Um, and it was a huge experiment, not just for us, for a lot of companies around the world. The advantage of being a software company um, is that you can pretty much move to working from home with almost no disruptions for your day-to-day -day, uh, business. So that was one huge experiment and I'll, I'll share some more details about it. Um, the second aspect that we had to deal with over the last couple of weeks um, is uh, the killing of George Floyd and Black Lives Matter, uh, that for any company with presence in the US, it became a serious issue that we had to, uh, to address. Um, so um, even though I was born in the States, I grew up in Israel, so I consider myself more Israeli than American. Um, and um, um, and, you know, when we, read, when we read about the George Floyd uh, situation, we read about it as just as news. It was terrible news, but um, I didn't realize at first that I have to react to it. Um, but what we found out very quickly that is for our American employees, and we have about 50 or 60 employees in the States. Um, oh, Fiona, you can take this off, like that slide. It just confuses uh, me, I guess. Um, but uh, thanks. Um, but uh, um, so we realized that uh, like you, you can't just um, shut up as a CEO. I think historically when I started being a CEO of a software company, you cared about software development, product development, you know, go to market, things that are very business-like. Uh, and you tried not to mix politics with, with the company because it, these are very sensitive topics in some areas. And I think what has really changed now, even more than Corona, is that the George Floyd case, um, you have to step up as a CEO and you have to make um, moral and political statements that before were unacceptable almost uh, and you have to make a you, you need to, to you need to make a, you need to take a stand um, and it's expected I think so I'm 43 now um, and a lot of my employees are in their 20s and I think it's a bit of a different generation they expect their CEO to be vocal about things that they care about 
they want to work for a company that cares, a company that is, uh, has liberal values, has a strong moral uh, position. Um, and, and that is something that has changed. Um, and I can give you an example of how complicated these things get um, is that when we made a, a very, very firm stand uh, that we are in support of Black Lives Matter, we made donations, we, we, had, we had a bunch of activities as a company um, to encourage, basically to educate about diversity, to, to contribute um, to uh, NGOs uh, around that topic. Um, we had, a, I, I got a private email from one of my employees. We also employ, uh, I think about 15 uh, Arab employees uh, here in Israel in our Tel Aviv offices. And then the same week that George Floyd died, um, or got, got killed by the police, we had um, um, a Palestinian kid killed by the Israeli police in Jerusalem. And suddenly the fact that we gave a strong statement about Black Lives Matter, but we did not give a statement about that incident in Jerusalem, it didn't work out very well with the Israeli team and parts of the Israeli team. So you find yourself as a CEO starting to deal with things that um, are, are scary because you don't want to say the wrong sentence. You, know, you want to make sure that you're uniting your employees on matters that can be sometimes controversial. Um, so I think that the George case in the U.S. has made us also make, take a position in Israel, um, political position within the company, uh, and hopefully we did it with the right sensitivity. And going back to, to the, the, the work from home, um, I think that for software companies, the days of five days in the office are, are gone. Like that's a, that's a monumental shift in the, in the work environment. Um, we, we had, you know, in Israel, I would say in our big hubs, unless you're a sales director, like unless you're in the sales team uh, or in the customer success team, everyone worked from the office. I think that already now we hear from our employees that they feel that they're more productive working from home. They don't want to come back to the office five days a week, even if there was no corona. So um, there is an expectation now from employees that we come up with a model of some hybrid work model where an office is a place that is more focused on social gathering than the actual work. Um, so I think that if there is one contribution for COVID um, in a positive way to, to the tech ecosystem is that it kind of unleashed or it made us not afraid from scenarios where it's completely distributed and you find the right opportunities to create the social structure that you need for a, for a strong company culture. And that is something that we're literally dealing with right now on a daily basis. We have uh, meetings and discussions and we're gathering data and what do we do post corona? Um, and it's probably gonna be some sort of a mix um, that people can choose where they wanna work from. I'm personally looking forward to traveling to Hawaii for a while, but don't tell anyone. Um, the problem with video is that it's easy to know where you are, but uh, uh, so I'm definitely, uh, if, when they open up New Zealand, uh, now seriously, in December and January, I plan to be in New Zealand if I can go there, because I want to I want to lead by example. So CEOs are first uh, to, to allow for that because they want to go and travel. Uh, but I think that's going to, it's going to happen worldwide. So thank you, Liad. So I think it, it has been a, a pretty crazy roller coaster. And, I, you know, I think one of the interesting things is none of us are alone. Uh, we can't see the faces of everybody on the webinar, but uh, I assume if you're in the UK, you're happy to be finally out. And in the US, I think you're gingerly stepping out. And I think the thing that's been interesting is with, with Israel is we've actually been out for a couple of weeks already. But that month of March was very dramatic and very critical because when I look at a second to ourselves, so we're a venture capital fund. We had 42 active companies in the portfolio going into the crisis. And it was really about making sure they got capital. We worked so hard during quarantine, because I, I was in quarantine those first two weeks, that we actually secured $200 million of cash for the portfolio companies. And when the investors reached out, and the main question on everyone's mind was, but how is this affecting you? The main outcome was, just a minute, before we even establish if it's affecting us, let's make sure that people have cash, and let's make sure people have credit. And I think a question that I'm mainly dealing with these days is, okay, so how are the companies now that the, that the crisis is behind you? And I think that that is a very, very complicated question because Israel is not necessarily a standalone society. As I said a moment ago, Israel is really an R&D center that is deeply tied to the UK, to Europe, to the US. And without those other countries coming out of 
quarantine and re returning back on their economies, we're really not going to see the massive impact. And I think the trigger, the, the trick for all of us, definitely the massive startup ecosystem in Israel that's been grounded on the ground and used this time exactly as Liad, Liad said, to develop, to work efficiently from home, to progress the product. But really, I think the question that we're all dealing with is, but who are the customers going to be? How are the customers going to be looking? Has appetite changed? Is demand going to change? And I think with reading reports all over the place that are talking about impact that's going to roll into Q4, Q3, and even into next year. And I think the main goal that the Israeli startup ecosystem, especially the innovators, but also the entrepreneurs, is to use this time to secure capital and develop ideas. Now, what's crazy is that in all this startup, you know, quarantinization and the world on its head, you actually saw some massive exits out of Israel. You saw Move It, there was a, a, it was announced that they were acquired by Intel for a billion dollars. NetApp announced buying uh, Spot for $450 million. Optimal Plus was bought by National Instruments for 365. And for those of you who followed, I think it was yesterday, Microsoft announced buying Cybrex for $165 million. You're still seeing the massive demand. The world isn't stopping, it's just about staying ahead of it. Now, one of the things, and I'm actually part of one of these committees, the Israel Innovation Authority, um, it's not, you know, what's interesting is looking how the UK has been very, very, very strong with its incentives um, and the US. The way that the Innovation Authority in Israel dealt with the virus is they've actually launched a series of programs to give very, very strong support to the startup ecosystem, but also to the growth startups covering 40% of losses, encouraging institutions to invest. So it's not about defending, it's just about people getting people back to work. You're actually seeing the Innovation Authority actively rolling up its sleeves, doling out huge amounts of capital to promote innovation so that even though the climate around us is a bit tricky, it's making sure that the machine doesn't stop working. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to ask Elena, uh, I hear you've just started as a CEO of a new young startup. So what do you think of the crisis impact of startups? Uh, weren't you afraid of the risk when you took this new job? Um, I was very worried in about probably two or three months ago because it did look like uh, the times ahead were gloom and doom. However, I think I'm going to be a little bit biased here because our company, we did start our company during COVID pandemic and we actually raised capital during COVID pandemic. We now have seven people in the company and um, we are, we really believe that we can make this happen in the next couple of months uh, before the second wave hits. I, I truly think that there will be a second wave. So we are trying to stay ahead of that and uh, roll out our MVP and raise the first round of capital by January. So it's looking very positive for our company, but I'm not sure if it has a, a lot to do with the sector that we are in because we are in the elderly care and aging uh, in place which I think is a very hot topic right now because I'm not sure what was happening in the UK, but uh, the rates of um, infection were very, very high in the assisted living facilities in Israel. So I think a lot of uh, people and a lot of investors see a massive value in the venture that we are starting uh, because it will actually protect the elderly who are at the very high risk. So from my perspective, perspective, COVID is a terrible, terrible thing for the world, for the economy, but somehow it did bring opportunities to a lot of um, companies and startups and ventures. So I think we should remain positive. No, I think that, and it's great looking at your face. You can feel your energy through the screen. So I think, but I think that's a very good observation. I think that as crazy and as tragic as this, this virus has hit us all, crisis is a time of opportunity. And um, I know someone was saying to me recently that it's totally pushed ahead e-commerce, 
you're seeing a lot more demand for cyber products. You're seeing massive demand for elderly care, um, for forewarning, predictive analytics in the healthcare space. There's, there's whole industries that have totally moved center stage with that demand. But I think, Liad, it would be interesting to hear with you, and you, and you made some good touch points before. Where do you see the opportunity um, you know, to your business um, not just in working from home, but what other kinds of opportunities do you think that the crisis may have created? I think the biggest, of, biggest opportunity now is to short the stock market that is behaving <laughs> completely unrelated to the actual economy. So that's, you know, uh, that's where I'm going to put my money in. Uh, I, I think that um, what I think what um, uh, what people like again, stock market is a, is a terrible indication of economic health. I completely, um, the problem is that investors and VCs and, you know, and a lot of uh, rich people that have money in the stock market, they're optimistic again because their stocks are high. Uh, so it's crazy how the VC market is supposed to be offset with the stock market, but the mood of the individuals who are making investment is, is, is closely tied to that market. I think that what we are seeing is, um, we are seeing over optimism and people think that, oh, the crisis is behind us. I think the crisis has not even started. Recession has not really started. It's starting in a big way. You know, we have uh, over 300 major brands as customers, you know, retailers like Ikea, like Michael Kors, uh, like, uh, um, uh, like matches fashion in the UK, um, a lot of high, high fashion brands and uh, furniture brands. Um, and when you look at these retailers, you know, some of the um, direct-to-consumer retailers, they were doing great in terms of consumer demand, but they couldn't supply enough product because warehouses uh, were shut down and they couldn't get their supply chain to work. When you look at retailers with physical presence, well, yes, if your e-commerce is up 500%, you may be happy if you're in the digital, digital team, but you have a thousand stores where no one can enter and, and buy products and you lose the season, yeah, it's not really encouraging uh, that e-commerce went up because you're going to go under. And we already saw some bankruptcies and we're going to see a lot of bankruptcies. I think that uh, cash is king and if you're leveraged, uh, you're in trouble. And a lot of the retailers in the world, especially the ones who got acquired by PEs, they, mm -hmm. they are just too leveraged and they will go, they will file for chapter 11 and they will try to, to stay afloat. But I don't think we still have seen how bad the heat is going to be on everyone and anyone, you know, uh, in Israel, I think we have about 15% uh, unemployment rate and I'm talking about not going below 10% unemployment rate uh, before the end of the year, where last year, I think it was about three or 4% unemployment rate. I think I don't remember the exact number. Um, these people are not going to go to restaurants. They're not going to buy clothes. They're, they're not going to spend. So there is a ripple effect and we are, we haven't seen it yet. So, it's like we, there is the first aftershock. Everyone tries to assess what's going on. Um, but I, I think trouble is coming. Um, and, and we, uh, um, when, um, and I'm not just talking, I'm not talking about startups. Startups are relatively agile, you know, if you're, especially if you're a software startup, if really shit hits the fan, you can lay off 50% of your staff and survive a year uh, with, with a terrible hit. If you are, if, you know, a store with physical location and you have to pay rent and you have to pay debt, like it's, you, you can get in trouble. So um, I'm extremely cautious about the next uh, year. I, everyone that I know, sorry, decreased their spending in a major way. We, we were supposed to add, um, I, um, we probably, um, we did a hiring freeze in Corona. So we, we probably 40 new employees that I plan to hire this year. I'm not going to hire them. Um, you know, we, uh, uh, as part of McDonald's, we were we we rolled out. We are we are live in in the U.S. in about twelve thousand restaurants. We are live in Australia. We were supposed to roll out in other countries. Uh, of course, Corona changes uh, rollout plans. Um, so if you think about again from from the McDonald's perspective, perspective, restaurants were closed in the U.K. for a couple of months. And in in McDonald's, a lot of these restaurant owners, these are small businesses. Uh, it is uh, these are family businesses, people who own one or two or three restaurants of McDonald's, uh, and they need help like any other SMB. That basically, people just didn't go. Uh, they, they, it was shut down. And then how do you restart? How do you restart supply chain of a giant like McDonald's? These are super complex tasks, um, and I think that um, one more thing that we're going to see um, is that a lot of people who lost their jobs 
for whatever reason, because of Corona, they will not get back to the workplace. Uh, you know, if you're in your late fifties and you lost your job because you work in an events company, I don't know if they're going to hire you uh, whenever ev events come back or they will opt in to hire someone younger and cheaper. Um, so I, I think that for some industries and for some segments of society, it's going to be a devastating blow. Um, and we exercise caution and we recommend uh, all our friends to exercise caution. That, but that's a very interesting comment that you made, Liad, and I, and I think but that is also where I think the opportunity comes. So you're talking rightly so that we're still going to see the hit. Probably we're only, we've, made, we've come through the first wave and all the companies that have managed to secure the capital and are going to make their way through it. Um, and I agree with you that I think the next wave will probably be later this year, where many of these companies are going to see that there's not necessarily a pickup in demand. And when that mm -hmm. happens, they're going to have to take a second um, hit. Um, and that is going to be the bigger one because those that stretch the capital today and, and downsized, and there's all these beautiful words like streamlined expenses and streamlined investment, you're suddenly going to see things have a bigger impact. But I think one of the things that we put a lot of focus on in our portfolio has not be, has been to not touch the R&D teams. I think the ultimate goal these days is to take advantage, as you mentioned, Liad, about how efficient it is to work from home, to make sure that this is the time to innovate. This is the time, you know, in some of our companies, we've been actually actively recruiting because there's been so much downsizing going on in other places. We've got at least three companies within the last month have been dramatically increasing their workforce. So I think the time at the moment of challenge is a great time of opportunity. And when you're talking about a society that is very, very deeply driven by try, try again, and you know, there's, there's this very strong survival instinct that's an underlying mindset of the Israeli entrepreneur, you're really seeing how they're looking around uh, with a degree of understanding, though I'm not going to, to diminish what Liad says, which is it is still a very, very complicated time because on the one hand, you're dealing with your families. Many people have had salary cuts or have lost their jobs, but this is actually an opportunity for the university. And, I, and I'm going to talk for a moment about myself. Um, I did my executive MBA um, in the building that is the background uh, to Moshe Tzviran's uh, screen. I did my MBA there in 2003, 2005. At the time, I was a uh, I think a director um, with Israel's largest conglomerate, and I was busy exploring where next. And I think it was a great opportunity for me to have the executive MBA. And I, and I don't want to sound corny because what was amazing is I've been a financial executive nearly all of my business career, but the MBA program there and the collaboration with the um, International University in Chicago of Northwestern uh, gave me a lot of clarity. And, and what I found very funny is I opened up my... Um, my uh, emails this morning and uh, two amazing women reached out to me and said well we've actually been made redundant at the moment um, and we're thinking that this is a great opportunity for us to try to apply for the MBA program can you put in a good word and, and probably even write us a reference so I think the trick in life and the, there's a famous saying I think it's very across all languages you know to make lemonade out of lemons um, I think even with you Moshe um, who unfortunately you have technical difficulties and you're not able to speak today and you gave me a chance to not shut up. So I think that worked out well. So I'm going to give though Ilana, who I am... It worked out well it. for you, Fiona, and I did not work out well for Moshe. <laughs> yes, I know. But I think Elena will be a good example. I understand that you're now finishing the Global MBA in Venture. Why don't you talk a bit about maybe when you went for it, where you were in your career, and maybe what it's given you, because uh, I think that'd be cool. Sure. Um, so I'm originally from Russia, uh, but I lived in the UK for about 19 years before I moved to Israel. And um, I think the question why I moved to Israel is a very big one. First of, first of all, I love this country. I don't know what it is about this country, but I feel so at home here. I've never felt this way anywhere else. And um, when I was coming here, I was leaving London. I was leaving um, the banking industry where I spent 12 years. Uh, last three, I was working as a project manager for the Royal Bank of Canada in two different departments and I loved my job 
but well people who live in london you guys know what weather is like so you know this was not a big question <laughs> tel aviv or london <laughs> Um, and I thought that the MBA at Tel Aviv University would be an amazing, an amazing opportunity for me to start mm -hmm. my life here because this is a great platform to learn new skills, um, meet new people, build a network. And since I'm new to the country, this was extremely, extremely valuable. And I feel like I've learned a lot from Moshe as well as others, uh, as other teachers. And I feel like I've built an amazing network and fr of friends and people who I might work with um, at the later stages of my career. And of course I got a job out of it. So my dream really came true from that perspective. Well, that is amazing. And thank you, Elena. So Liad, before I pass over to you, because I, just found out that you actually teach, teach entrepreneurship. I'm going to quickly address one question in the Q&A, which is a good one. And I'm going to read it. Well, on one side, we hear about amazing numbers and capital available. On the other side, we're hearing about the unemployment increase, and it really is. Um, and it's going to create huge problems of instability coming. Um, what are the suggestions on closing the gap? Um, environment healthy, government, I'm not going to talk politics. Um, incentives, government force each company to be more involved? Well, that's a good question. Um, first of all, I think that um, just like many other countries, the Israeli government stepped forwards to give um, a degree of support. There was quite a little public back a backlash um, to make it even more efficient and, and larger budgets um, to people who were independent largely. I think the biggest hit, and it's probably in the UK and the rest of the world as well, is for the independent people. Um, you know, hairdressers, barbers, small mums and pops. Um, so there was very good uh, capital doled out. It's probably not enough, not on any level, but it's, it was enough to help some people breathe. But I think the bigger thing is, I talked to along before, in, in our world, the Israel in Innovation Authority announced last week a two billion shekel. So that's just under 500 million pounds program that's going to be incentivizing investment in growth stage Israeli companies. Now, growth stage companies have a larger manpower bases. We're not talking about Elena's company that has a few employees. We're talking really about 10, 20, 30, 50, 100 and more companies. And I think that's massive because it's not just about giving the money one sided. It's about creating jobs and it's about creating jobs that are going to you know, help the society and help the nation because ultimately the larger companies Israel can create um, either they became major independent players or, uh, like Liad's company, they, they're acquired for a very large amount of money and become a major center of, of employment in the country. Um, so just going back to Liad, you can comment on what I've said, but Liad, I want you to talk afterwards about, I hear that you're teaching at the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Program. So maybe tell us what you teach everyone else. So let me comment first about something you said, and I uh, kindly disagree with. <laughs> I think that the government announcement of these funds, you can add it to the bunch of dozens of other announcements they made and put it in the trash bin because there's nothing that really the Israel's government is completely dysfunctional. Um, and we have a, a corrupt prime minister that just wants to stay uh, the prime minister. So now I think that the Israeli high tech is successful, especially in Corona times, despite the government. And the gov government is doing nothing to support tech companies, no matter what stage. So uh, um, anyone who waits for government to support them, you can just, you know, close the door and let all your employees go home. So uh, I, I don't know anyone who expects any help from the government. Um, and really, uh, um, so, so and that's the status quo here. Uh, and, uh, you know, um, and, and I don't think that, uh, um, that government playing a VC is a good play anyway. Uh, but we keep it for another discussion. Specifically on my teaching, I used to teach in a, in a, in a Tel Aviv MBA program, an entrepreneurship program. Um, so I'm actually a film student. Uh, so I graduated the, the, film, uh, um, the film school in Tel Aviv University. And I was not good enough to be a film director. So, uh, so uh, they made me an entrepreneur. Um, and I started teaching in the MBA program, which is across the loan from the film uh, school so I would go to classes and I would sigh 
you know, with, with sadness that I should have been like with all the hipsters on the other building. But uh, but jokes aside, um, um, I, I think that uh, Tel Aviv has a great MBA program. Um, I stopped teaching because I moved to New York with my company a couple of years ago. Uh, and when I came back, no one called me back. Uh, so, uh, so it was, uh, I had a really good couple of years there. I was teaching the Entrepreneurship Foundations course, which basically was, um, I forgot how many hours, I think it was 24 hours um, in a semester where we looked at how to start a company, you know, like how do you come up with ideas? How do you qualify your ideas? The nice thing, when I started my first company in 2004, I had to learn everything on my own because there was no, uh, there was not a lot of teaching on entrepreneurship. There were not a lot of books or blogs. So there was not a lot of information about it. And we made probably every mistake in the book on our way to our first success. Today, you don't have to go through all these mistakes. You can do other mistakes, which are better. Um, and, uh, and one thing that I highly encourage anyone who wants to be an entrepreneur is to know the theory around it. There is so much great materials, you know, books that are, were written by great entrepreneurs, books that are very schematic about um, the entrepreneurial uh, journey. Um, and uh, so, so that, and that's what I was teaching. You know, there is a process called customer development. How do you go from having an idea for a company to actually qualifying whether this idea is worthwhile, how to find the right product market fit, etc. So we focused a lot around the discipline of how to come up with the right idea and how to qualify it, um, which I, we, I think is the most critical step in every startup. Um, and it, yeah, so it was a, it was a great experience. And uh, maybe when I retire from McDonald's in a couple of years. Uh, Moshe and the team will uh, will invite me to teach again. Cool. So I want to say thank you because I'm conscious of time. We have five minutes. And I want to give uh, Kawa and uh, Richard maybe a chance to wrap up for us. So um, I just want to say what a pleasure and privilege it's been here. I've um, been in Israel now for nearly 30 years and, I, and I'm a massively strong advocate for Tel Aviv University. So thank you very much for inviting me to say a few words. Um, I look forward to continuing and um, if there's any follow-on questions um, and that you would like to ask, feel free. I'm sure the Tel Aviv University team can help connect. Um, it's an amazing ecosystem in Israel. Um, I remember one of our entrepreneurs uh, once used to laugh that if you see three people sitting on a bench in Holland, they're sitting uh, smoking or doing something else. If you see three people sitting on a bench in Tel Aviv, they're probably busy arguing, disagreeing and thinking of their next great thing. So I look forward to when the world comes a little bit back down to normality, I'm seeing you in Israel and hopefully at Tel Aviv. And uh, thank you for the opportunity again. Um, Richard, I see you're with us. I am um, indeed, yeah. But Cara, um, I think you want to speak first, right? Yeah, well, first, I just want to thank you so much, Fiona and Liad and Elena. Thank you so much for your really wonderful words. You're leaving us with so much to think about. And um, it really was a great conversation. So thank you for joining us. Thank you to Moshe behind the scenes. You kind of brought all of us together today. And Moshe, we're sorry we didn't see you. I guess we'll have to do this again. And Elena, just so you know, the weather today in London is 28 degrees and boiling hot. So every now and then, London could surprise you. Um, Anyway, what I'd like to do now, just before we wrap up, is to um, introduce Richard Anton, who's going to give closing remarks. He's the vice chair of Tau Trust and the co-founder and general partner at Ox, a leading European venture capital firm partnering with strong entrepreneurial teams. And Richard, um, over to you, and thank you for also joining us today. Thank you, Cara, and uh, thank you to all of our speakers, to Moshe uh, and uh, uh, also to uh, Fiona, who I've known for many years and uh, collaborated with very happily, and Liad, who I've known for even more years and uh, wish that I've invested in his companies, uh, and to Elena, who it's a, who it's a pleasure to meet. Um, I'd like to say that in this, uh, in this time that we're in uh, of coronavirus difficulty and all the challenges that it brings, Tel Aviv University is a great source of light, actually light unto the nations. Uh, I'm proud of the leading faculty we have who've dropped everything uh, to fight the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and I'm proud of the leading role that Tel Aviv University is, is playing in the global battle uh, to, read it, to beat it. You've heard a little bit about it 
and you can read on the website about some of the major advances that faculty are making. Um, please take a look. Uh, Professor Jonathan Gershoni, for example, who's a renowned virology expert, is a long way towards developing a vaccine uh, and has a US patent uh, for his vaccine design, which was recently awarded. Um, but at the same time, um, and Liad talked a little bit about the realities that the world is facing and is going to have to face up to, uh, our reality is that there is a crisis at Tel Aviv University. Uh, before the pandemic, uh, there was no budget. Uh, that was uh, no budget resources that were applied to build and fund new labs uh, so quickly. Uh, but Tel Aviv University did heed the global call to action uh, and it's doing everything it can to be a key member of the winning team uh, in this battle of humanity against the virus. Uh, and the time has now come when the university can't continue alone to fund its major projects or to support uh, many students that it has who are also facing serious financial difficulties. Um, it can't continue alone to research and advance innovative projects such as robotic antibody tests and nano vaccines, and it needs our help. Um, we've recently embarked, therefore, on our biggest challenge yet, uh, which is our Drop Everything Emergency COVID-19 Drive, uh, which is a global campaign and the UK is a big part of it, um, aimed at raising a million dollars. And that amount is being matched by a donor in size and scope. Um, that campaign, the funds raised from that came to go to, uh, campaign are going to help Tel Aviv University fast track prevention and cures, purchase equipment and expand public testing uh, and aid vulnerable students, financially vulnerable students who are in critical need. Um, that's why uh, I'd like to invite you to join all of us in, uh, in donating to that and any amount will show that you care. I think, Cara, you'd be able to follow up uh, with the address of our emergency appeal page. Cara, is that right? Is that, a, is that available I, for yes, everybody? Yes, we'll send everybody who's on this webinar some information, of course. Great, thank you very much. So uh, thank you all for, all, all for attending and, um, and uh, listening and uh, thanks again to our speakers and I should also say to Sharon for her opening remarks. It's a pleasure to be with all of you today. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.